as we've improved our technological access to data, we've improved what we can say. Um, so this idea of following an individual over the course of their life, and you know, you might see an immigrant who's been in the U.S. for three or four years, and then find them again ten years later, and then twenty years later to trace out their trajectory. And when we did that, we really were blown away by how many of our own myths were overturned by looking into the data. I'm Bethany McLean. Did you ever have a moment of doubt about capitalism and whether greed's a good idea? And I'm Luigi Zingales. We have socialism for the very rich, rugged individualism for the poor. And this is Capital Isn't, a podcast about what is working in capitalism. First of all, tell me, is there some society you know that doesn't run on greed? And most importantly, what isn't? We ought to do better by the people that get left behind. I don't think we shouldn't kill the capital system in the process. One of the issues that we are trying to analyze in this podcast is the interaction between democracy and capitalism. Now, if democracy is really a social contract, why don't we allow everybody who is willing to sign in to sign in? Why don't we have open borders for immigration? And while this might seem preposterous to a lot of people, I think a lot of economists are in favor of it. So we decided that we wanted to start to analyze this question and uh, to start discussing the benefits and costs of immigration. We decided to invite Leah Bustan, who not only is a professor of economics at Princeton, but uh, she is a co-author of a book, Street of Gold, America's Untold Story of Immigrant Success. The central argument of the book is, for the first time in history, we have the data to analyze not only what happens to immigrants, but what happened to immigrants' children. And so to see systematically whether immigrants uh, struggle, whether they will succeed, and how their children do vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the population. And I think if there is one bottom line, is immigrants do fine. In fact, they do better than similar natives with uh, the same level of income distribution. Let's start from uh, an obvious point for you, but not for many of our listeners, is the kind of data and work you have done to document for the first time the history of, of immigration in America, because uh, most of our listeners have no idea what is possible today and how much sort of sweat and pain uh, there are behind each one of those uh, pictures. Well, that's right. We have two major waves of immigration to the U.S., one is during the Ellis Island period, roughly 1880 to 1920, and then one is in recent years. So if someone's captured in the 1900, 1910, and 1920 census, and their life is changing in some way, um, maybe they're moving around the country, maybe they're changing their occupation, that's something that we can pick up in the census data, but we need to know who's who and try to follow people over time. Like being a curious grandchild who goes to Ancestry.com to look up their own grandparents, we really began our research by going to the website Ancestry.com and typing in names and then realizing that we could do this for 100 families or 1,000 families, but just multiply that process by millions to the point that the Ancestry lawyers eventually contacted us and said we had been driving much of their, the rise in traffic to their site. Now they have a research partnership with us and with other academics. In the modern data, it's in a way much easier because we have a data state at this point. So our data comes from the IRS tax records, and that's going to cover much of the workforce and allow us to follow people over time through different tax filings, but also follow their kids from a childhood household when they're listed as a tax dependent into adulthood when they will be going into the workforce themselves. I'm always fascinated by storytelling and by myth making. And as you looked at this and thought about this, do you have a view on which of our myths about immigration have been helpful, broadly speaking, and which of our myths about immigration have been hurtful, broadly speaking? Well, I think the, the myth that's been hurtful lately and that needed to be excavated a little bit by this work is really an implicit comparison between immigrants 100 years ago and immigrants today. Sometimes that really doesn't come to the surface when we hear what politicians and policymakers are talking about. 
But it really came to a point after the famous closed door meeting when President Trump was alleged to have said, we don't want immigrants coming here from whole countries. We want immigrants from Norway. It was really hearkening back to this earlier era when our mi migrants primarily came from Europe. So 100 years ago, 90% um, of the foreign born living in the US were from European countries. And implicit in this statement of President Trump is somehow an idea that those immigrants were better able to economically and culturally assimilate into the country. Oftentimes, we hear this kind of implicit comparison from both sides of the aisle. It's not only from uh, Republicans who, who are saying, well, it was better back then when our migrants came from Europe. We also hear it from the left when there are um, claims that immigrants these days are coming from a more diverse set of countries and therefore facing barriers in the labor market because of skin color, because of stereotypes about ethnic background. So when we turn to the data and found again and again, whether you're talking about second generation children and how much they earn, or whether you're talking about different measures of cultural assimilation, when we found again and again that these two waves of migration, one from Europe 100 years ago and one from around the world today, looked very similar, we just kept having our mind blown again and again. And I think that's the core harmful uh, myth about immigration these days. But Leah, while, while Trump was wrong on which are the quote-unquote good countries or the bad countries, I think that one thing that your book shows is that there is an enormous cross-sectional variation. And actually, I'm very proud to report that uh, when you look in, fi in figure six, where you talk the country of origin in uh, 1880, Italians do extremely well and actually much better, I'm sorry to report, Bethany, than people from Scotland or Wales. Uh, and that's very remarkable because... They don't speak the same language. They were heavily discriminated. Even in the 1980 wave, you see that there is an enormous variation. It says, if you come from Haiti, I'm sorry to report, you don't do very well. But so if you come from Norway, ironically. On the other hand, if you come from Hong Kong, you do extremely well. And Italians still do okay. Now, there is a very different performance because in the 1980, you divide between uh, boys and girls. There's a very different uh, performance between Italian girls and Italian boys. Italian boys seem to be doing well in 1980. Italian girls, much less so. How can you explain that? Well, I'm glad you pointed out the gender differences because they were really startling to us. So you mentioned if, if your parents come from Haiti, you don't do that well. That's true for sons. And that's also true if your parents come from Jamaica or Trinidad and Tobago. So you would start to think maybe this is a race story, um, that these are immigrants who come from majority black countries. But wait a second, the daughters of immigrants from those three countries, Haiti, Jamaica, and Trinidad and Tobago, do very well. And the opposite pattern is true for uh, European immigrants in recent years. Um, the sons of European immigrants are doing well, the daughters not as well. And so in the case of the Caribbean, um, we turned to sociologists to ask, you know, does this make sense to you? Does it make sense that uh, the daughters of Caribbean parents would be doing well and the sons would not be doing so well? And they said yes, because there's very different parenting practices by gender. Daughters are often required to come home right after school and not allowed to go out into the neighborhoods. The neighborhoods that Caribbean families live in are often dangerous. They have a large police presence and some of the sons um, then get caught up in the criminal justice system, but much less so the daughters. But I think that Bethany and I more or less have the same skin color. I think that uh, by most standards, I think we are the same skin. But why my ancestors have done so much better than Bethany's ancestors? Do you have an explanation for that? The data point that you're talking about are kids who are raised in families with similar income and resources households that are all at the 25th percentile of the income distribution when the children are at home. And then the question is, how are the kids doing 30 years later? Those kids who are from Italian, um, Irish, Portuguese households are reaching higher levels of income than those children whose parents are from Scotland, etc. And the parents from Scotland are reaching higher um, income levels than U.S. born parents. Um, I don't have a single overarching explanation that would account for that cross-country heterogeneity. Um, and there's only around 15 data points to play with uh, for the past and around 45 data points to play with for today, given that we're talking about country of origin differences. So I think 
it's you start to run into um, some sort of degrees of freedom problems with your favorite explanation there. But it's just important to point out that exactly those groups that politicians would point to historically as saying they're never going to contribute. That would be the Italian, the Irish, the Portuguese. It was those groups where the children were doing the best. So we don't necessarily have a good intuition for which country of origin groups are going to have the greatest success in the U.S. And it's not always the ones that you think. So you might take a look at the pattern with the sons today and say, oh, of course it makes sense that sons from Haiti, Jamaica, and Trinidad and Tobago are not doing that well. But wait a second, how about the daughters? So I think a lot of our simplistic intuition gets punctured when we start to look deeply into the different elements of the heterogeneity there. Why do you think that is? Why do you think the the political discourse is so is so dis- disassociated from the underlying data in some of these cases, many of these cases? Well, it's powerful to compare households that are at the same level of resources. When we look out into the world around us, we're often not doing that sort of implicit controlled experiment. Instead, what we see is that it's more likely for households where the parents came from Haiti to be at the 25th percentile. And it's more likely for households whose parents came from Hong Kong to be at the 75th percentile of the income distribution. And then if we see that the kids are doing better or worse, um, we might associate that uh, to the country of origin differences. And so let's take a look at the kids where the parents are doing a similar set of jobs, they're earning a similar amount, um, but we have country of origin differences. And that really focuses the eye. Um, So some of the countries like Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, that are often under discussion these days as contributing to the quote unquote crisis at the southern border, those are country of origin groups that tend to have households uh, with low income levels. But now we can compare them to other households with similarly low income levels. And we see that the children whose parents came from Central America are actually doing quite well. They're right in the middle of the pack. So, sorry if I come back to the difference, because I understand that race explanation are completely wrong, but the cultural explanation seems to have some uh, power. In a sense, I'm sure you know that there is a paper by Paola Sapienza and Paolo Giuliano looking at children in Florida and looking at their performance in school. People coming from countries, uh, what they call long-term orientation, that means that they value the future a lot, do perform much better in school. And those are the countries like Italy, Portugal, and uh, I'm sorry to say, Bethany is is a very short-term orientation, but uh, jokes aside, there seem to be some cultural value. My favorite explanation is actually the family eating at the common table at night. Countries that uh, have the tradition of eating around the table, and the Chinese are first, and the Southern Europeans are second, do very well. Why? Because there is a lot of transmission of culture within the family. And I'm sorry to report, many Americans don't eat together. They graze uh, in the refrigerator. And in the process, they don't transmit culture from one generation to the next. Well, let me start by the main explanation that accounts for the data historically. We know almost everything there is to know about these families. We know where they're living, father's occupation, who they're married to, etc. And what we find historically is that geography explains much of the difference between children of immigrants and children of U.S. born. So if you are going to compare children who are living next door to each other, one has a U.S. born father, one has a foreign born father, we actually don't see much of a immigrant advantage there. Instead, the immigrant advantage comes from the fact that, first of all, immigrants avoided the South. The South at the time, circa 1910, was an agricultural region, cotton growing area, not a place of high upward mobility for anyone. So I don't think there's much room for cultural explanation left over, given how powerful geography was historically. But today, at least as best as we can tell, and so there really has to be pretty strong caveats on this because we don't have the micro data in the millions today. Geography matters, but it's less important now than it was in the past. So that leaves a lot more scope for your favorite cultural explanation, Luigi, today than it does in the past. And so You know, if you take a look at where the kids who were based at the 25th percentile are ending up in adulthood now, you can't fail to notice that a set of Asian countries, Hong Kong, China, India, Vietnam, um, are at the very top of the list. And so perhaps part of what's going on there is a cultural explanation today. And I just don't think there's much room left over historically. Um, But now 
it, it's an open question. It's not that I want to shy away from that explanation. It's just that I don't have really good evidence either in favor of it or against it. Now, your, your book has a very powerful and, and optimistic message about immigration, that this is uh, uh, good, that the immigrants are very effective. And in addition, they don't seem to subtract anything from the natives. And so can you explain anti-immigration sentiments? Because it's a fact that there is some anti-immigration sentiment. And given your data, it's sort of hard to imagine that there is. Can you explain it maybe on the fact that the Americans feel that the children of immigrants are overtaking some important positions in society ahead of them and they feel uh, left behind? Um, well, I think that's possible. So when we put out the findings that controlling for household income, children of immigrants move farther up the income distribution than children of U.S. born, we did that get that kind of response and that kind of pushback from people on social media saying, well, see, there are opportunities that our kids would have had if not for immigration. But I can almost guarantee you that if we had put out the opposite findings, like if that's the way the data had turned out, that somehow the children of immigrants were not able to move up as quickly, um, then we would have heard pushback in the other direction saying, hey, take a look at this. Immigrant parents don't earn very much because they come from lesser developed countries, but now even their kids aren't able to make it. And so the fiscal burden of these low-skilled immigrants is now falling on the rest of us with this group not paying much in taxes and expecting uh, social services um, in, res in response. So um, it's sort of like a damned if you do, damned if you don't, that you can take a look at that pattern and you can find reasons to be anti-immigration. But I would argue that the relevant question is not, you know, let's start a race with everyone who was raised at the 25th percentile and see how far they get. The relevant question is when immigrants move into the country, what happens to the wages and jobs of the U.S. born? Because it's not like when we're up for a job, we're competing with only other people who were raised at the same income level that we were. You know, so we're not just siloed into groups of 25th percentile households. OK, now you all have to compete. And if one of you gets a job, the other one won't. Uh, so I'm not personally sure that that finding um, really speaks to the question of do immigrants harm natives or not, though I take your point that it was certainly read that way by some people. Instead, you know, I've been very inspired by the work in economics on that question directly. You know, do, when immigrants arrive, what happens to the U.S. born? And I noticed something recently that I think is interesting and I just want to raise, which is we've been spending so much time talking about what happens when immigrants arrive to the wages of competing U.S.-born workers, and very little time talking about what happens when immigrants arrive to prices. And an important price is housing prices or rents in the area in which immigrants arrive. And there are a couple of studies that show that when immigrants arrive in the local area, housing prices and rents go up. Using very similar research design to the studies that end up finding that when immigrants arrive in an area, wages don't change. That's been kind of lost in the, in the discussion of the literature, I think. And I recently started thinking about it more because inflation is more in the news these days. Let's say immigrants did compete with the U.S. born and one U.S. born or two U.S. born people lost work. That would be a very heavy burden on those one or two people. And the rest of the population may not pay attention to that. Whereas housing prices are something that everyone thinks about in the local area. So when immigrants move in, if the Albert's work and others' work is right, that, that rents go up. That could start to explain um, some of the resistance to immigration. You know, you may not hear as much about wages and unemployment. Instead, you may hear about things like, my, my town is getting crowded. Um, there's more traffic. There are more kids in school. It's too expensive for my own kids to buy a house in town because housing prices have gone up. And so when you start to think about those concerns um, as tied in to immigration and rising population, that's a new way of thinking about where some of this resistance might come from. The implicit, one of the implicit arguments of your book is that the, these narrow relative comparisons are all well and good, but maybe they are too narrow because if immigrants contribute to the growth of the, of the economy overall, then you have more pie for everybody, even if everybody's piece of it might be marginally, mar marginally less. But I think what, what, what you're saying is that even if that does happen, even if the pie is larger, there can still be resistance along the way because the pie getting larger can manifest in things like, oh, my home prices are going up and my neighborhood is crowded instead of it manifesting in a way that feels um, intuitively good. Does that make sense? 
That makes perfect sense. You know, the reaction to immigrants is always going to depend on how quickly we respond to these new people and new workers with new capital. We need to take a look at how responsive we are to these changes. Are, is there a restriction and resistance to new construction, for example, in an area when, when population grows for any reason, one of the reasons being immigration? Is our, our firms and workforce too slow to respond to new workers coming in? And so therefore, for a while, when, when immigrants increase the workforce, um, the capital stock may not respond quickly. And lately, with some of the work that we've been doing on analyzing the congressional record and trying to understand sort of stated political attitudes towards immigration, uh, we've noticed that certainly there's a rising polarization or political partisanship around immigration. Democrats are more likely to say positive things about immigrants and Republicans are more likely to say negative things. But when you take a look at the topics under consideration, Democrats and Republicans are equally likely to talk about labor market, equally likely to talk about fiscal burden. Where they differ is really on these you might say more cultural topics or more uh, kind of public safety and threat type of topics. So I'm not sure if you would refer to that as cultural or if there might be uh, something real there. But Republican speeches about immigration are much more likely to be about crime, terrorism, and issues around legality. So are immigrants sort of jumping the queue or crossing the border? Whereas speeches by Democrats are much more likely to be about family, and immigrants who face persecution, so sort of refugee issues. Economics does not seem to be the main driving force behind polarization or resistance to immigration. So if you were queen for a day or for a year, whatever, and uh, you could design the immigration policy, what would be your optimal immigration policy? You know, my answer is going to be very boring because I think of our book as a very status quo oriented book. It's not that we would like to radically change the immigration system, but first of all, we want to work towards preserving it and maintaining it. So like if I was queen for a day, it would be really boring. It would probably just be try to preserve what we have, marginally increase the number of slots to keep pace with population and economic growth and orient those new slots towards high skilled immigration, but really not to start changing uh, the current system, which has a lot of low skilled entry and not try to choke off low-skilled entry given our needs in the labor market in agriculture, construction, childcare, elder care, restaurant work. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you both for your um, very probing and interesting questions. I really enjoy the conversation. Please join the Stigler Center for the next webinar in our series on China's political economy. In this one, we'll explore whether there is a new era in the country's development. Learn more and register at chicagobooth.edu slash Stigler China series. I thought at first what an absolutely wonderful project and how important to bring data to this um, topic that is driven by emotion, not just presently, but has been driven by emotion through history. And if you bring data and facts to this topic, maybe you can move the discourse. I started to think as she talked that that was too optimistic and that the data is never going to sway the discourse, in part because the data itself doesn't make sense. When you think about the two, not the data itself, but the complaints themselves don't make sense. It cannot be true that immigrants can both be coming here and destroying our social fabric because they eat up too much of the social services and that they are coming here and taking American jobs and decreasing American standard of living. Those things those things can't be true simultaneously. I mean, they can be in, in different parts of the country, perhaps, but they can't both be broadly writ true. And yet those, those two narratives still grab hold. And so I started to wonder if for some reason the narratives about immigration that drive political decisions can ever be driven by fact or if there or if it's a misguided quest in the sense that there seems to be something so emotional about this topic and maybe maybe it just is per some of the things we've talked about that the facts only matter on a very micro level so even if you talk about the facts on a macro level they may not be what people in a given community are experiencing if the facts on a macro level don't resonate with what's happening in their micro community then the facts also feel irrelevant to the emotion Does that make sense? It does, but I think it's a little bit too pessimistic, uh, in my view, in a sense. Me? Pessimistic? No. (laughs) 
first of all, I think the facts are not just economic facts, are also social and cultural facts. I think that people don't react just to immigrants stealing their jobs or allegedly stealing their jobs. They react also on basically seeing some of the values that they cherish being completely overturned and changed. And I think that we economists are guilty as charged in, in ignoring those factors that are politically very important. And uh, for many towns, this is not a choice. So people who live in cities are much more friendly to immigration, part because they chose to live in places that are very diverse. Immigration finds a lot of resistance when it hits uh, little towns of people who didn't want to have anything to do with it. They wanted to live in their town the way it was uh, since their great-grandfathers came there, and they don't want change, and they are forced to confront change without a lot of economic benefits. Because I think that if you gain a lot, you're more willing to make compromises on your cultural and moral issues. But if you are not gaining a lot or possibly actually losing, this is... I thought that uh, what she said about rents is fascinating and very important and underestimated in the political debate. So I am a relatively poor person living in town on a rent, and there is this flow of immigrants, and I'm priced out of what I can afford, and I'm forced to move. I didn't choose to move, and I'm resentful, which, by the way, as a very easy and simple solution is if you want more immigration— you also have to have more permission to build more houses. So the perfect solution would be to have a immigration bill linked to build in my neighbor. So, you know, the NIMBY, they're not in my neighborhood. Uh, force the NIMBY that say, if you want immigration, you have to give up your restriction on building in the area. I do think that you're raising a really important question that 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 is that is important to discuss, which is then what policies do you do in addition to immigration? In other words, an immigration policy alone is not enough. It needs to be part of a broader package. Just like when we think about globalization, our conversation with Glenn Hubbard about bridges and walls. When you think about globalization, his argument would would be you, whether we agree with his specific strategies or not. We we didn't, but but his argument would be. But you need to think about what you do in addition to this. And I think the same thing would be true of immigration. It's a, it's a yes and. Um, and I think that's, that's really interesting. That, that's really interesting because this, her analysis does point to the fact that it has to be a yes and. It can't just be a yes and a free-for-all. But the answer is that we don't have a really sensible, big answer to the big question. So if you ask an economist, generally economists are not shy to pontificate on everything, right? So if you ask what... As an economist, what is the optimal amount of immigration? Most economists would say open borders. And just, they don't say it because they know that they look crazy. But that's kind of the implication. If you look at her results, uh, the book is very positive about immigration in every possible form of shape. And from this to conclude, we need to maybe increase an epsilon. So you have a policy that looks seems to be working extremely well. Why don't you at least suggest that you double up or you triple up? One of the things that she said was super interesting is that when you look at the historical record, there was opposition all the time uh, and is actually more at the presidential level. So if you look at the country overall, you want more immigration, but again, not in your backyard. Yeah, I found that fascinating. I guess it's, it reflects some of my ignorance, but I hadn't realized that we went from this open border policy to this much more restrictive policy. I think I vaguely knew about the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, and I knew obviously about some of the resistance to Catholicism, but I didn't know that there was this whole movement in the 1920s about how Catholicism was incompatible basically with, with democracy, and that suddenly you know we began banning nine out of 10 people who had been able to come to this country beforehand. And she does, she alludes to this very interesting question, which is, which is fascinating to think about, but just how much this somewhat random immigration policy has shaped the look of the United States today, because it, it 
it has. And yet it's been this policy that was never, that was sort of lurching from one extreme to another and um, based on racism and, and, and all sorts of ugly underlying things. And that's the country we've got today. And I know you can say that about lots of things, but it is pretty fascinating to think about that, right? How, how different the country could look. Yeah, but also how things are slowly changing. Uh, an interesting factoid, uh, my, my wife's family has been here forever. They, 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 it's very hard to tell when they came in. And they grew up in uh, Indiana, at least that part of the family. And this grandmother, when her mother started being in dating age, said, you cannot bring home a Catholic. Because she grew up in the 20s. And then uh, my wife, uh, the first husband was Italian-American. And the second husband is Italian-American. And when uh, we were engaged, the, the grandmother sent her a gift saying, it worked well with the first one, uh, good luck with the second. Uh, uh, so that she turned around in her lifetime uh, that uh, actually Catholics were fine. So I think that, that that's... a. Uh, I hope that uh, in the long term, these uh, differences might be sort of overcome. I, I like that, and I agree with you, and I hope you're right. But at the same time, as we've talked about in other episodes of this podcast, um, once upon a time, you might have been able to bring home a Republican, and now you can't bring home a Republican if you're in a Democratic family. So the, uh, the, 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 the dividing lines have just changed, but there's every bit as much hatred toward difference as there ever, ever was. It's just taken on a different form. Sorry, I guess I am the pessimist today, aren't I? <laughs> Have you ever wondered what goes on inside a black hole? Or why time only moves in one direction? Or what is really so weird about quantum mechanics? Well, then you should listen to Why This Universe. On this podcast, you'll hear about the strangest and most interesting ideas in physics, broken down by physicists Dan Hooper and Shalma Wegsman. If you want to learn about our universe, from the quantum to the cosmic, you won't want to miss Why This Universe, part of the University of Chicago Podcast Network. I think that she seems to be reluctant in analyzing the cultural component and the human capital component, and also some selection. And this is one of the moving stories, is I remember as I immigrated in this country in 1988, and I bought a TV for $50 that was microscopic, and I was watching every program to try to get uh, uh, better in English with not much of a success. One of the first things that came in the summer of 88 was the... Republican National Convention, where uh, Ronald Reagan gave what I think was the last speech he gave. One other thing he said that stuck in my memory 34 years later, God put America with two oceans on the side so that only the bravest and the, the best will arrive here, okay? Which, of course, is true for the immigrants who came uh, uh, by boat. Uh, if you take a plane, it doesn't take a lot of effort. But uh, I think that the more substantive point is there is a selection on the people who decide to take adversity and move. And particularly when you look at countries that are more disadvantaged, I think that the ones who move tend to be probably the, the best of the crop. So what is the impact that immigration does in the country that people immigrate from? The United States benefited tremendously from a lot of scientists and people who were educated in other countries who came here. Now, in some cases, they came here because they were chased away from the country of origin. Think about all the Jewish scientists uh, from Nazi Germany. But in other cases, uh, no, it is simply they are attracted because uh, this is a best, better place to, to work. And, uh, and while this is great for the United States, I'm not so sure it's great for the country. So Nigerian kids are really... Uh, doing very well in the United States. But if you, if you think about Nigeria, the damage that the emigration from Nigeria does to Nigeria is probably enormous. It's a really interesting question. She has that stunning statistic in her book, which I'm going to get directionally right, but specifically wrong, that 70% or 80% of the people from India who come here have an advanced degree, where only 8% of those in the country do. And if you just extrapolate that broadly and think what more advanced degrees might do in India, you can you can raise some interesting questions about what impact this has on, on the rest of the world. Then again, in most other areas, we don't really play fair with other countries. We don't do what's best for other countries. We do what's best for the United States. And so in a weird way to ask that question about immigration or to put that, that onus on immigration that it has to be good for the world, not just good for the United States, is not something we do in any other facet of economics. 
No, that's fair. But if you want to think in global terms, that that's, I think, is an interesting question to ask. And it's not just uh, the economic damage. I think there is also a political damage as well. And it's just uh, the, the immigrants are the people that probably are more likely to stand up to problems. So if you think about uh, reforming a corrupt system or improving uh, democracy, if all the more motivated people leave the country, who is left to, to make a change? Capitalism is a podcast from the University of Chicago Podcast Network and the Stiegler Center in collaboration with the Chicago Booth Review. Also check out promarket.org, a publication of the Stiegler Center. The show is produced by me, Matt Hodap, and Leah Cesarine, with production assistance from Utsoff Gandhi, Sebastian Berka, Chris Wheat, and Brooke Fox. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review for Capitalism wherever you get your podcasts. Mm-hmm.